much for that. Our dear Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for our health. We're thankful for such a wonderful school where we're free to speak of thee and thankful for the lessons we're learning um, about the right and the wrong ways to do it, to try to improve lives and um, Ask, we ask a special blessing on us that we will learn what thou would have us learn, and we're thankful for our instructor. And say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you very much, Wendy. Um, and you know, I, I too am very grateful that we can um, talk about God um, without without worrying, without without whispering um, here at American Heritage School. And uh, I think it'll be very interesting as, as we continue to study the, the French Revolution and as we think about about um, that revolution in relation to uh, our Father in Heaven. Well, today we're going to talk about um, the coming of the French Revolution, what you could call uh, maybe some of the causes of that revolution. Um, we'll uh, provide lots of context for you to really help you understand, because there's lots of information to wrap um, our heads around here uh, as we look at the causes, because it was a, a very um, complex situation. Um, and there are many, many sides to it, for sure. Um, also, uh, we'll spend some time looking at the two documents, the one by Abi Saye, uh, What is the Third Estate? A very famous document, um, short, um, and has lots of rich information. Uh, and then also we'll spend some time just talking generally uh, about the types of grievances found uh, in the uh, Cahier des Oléans, uh, which is this book of grievances of the Third Estate at Versailles uh, to the Estates General. And uh, we'll, of course, we'll talk about what all those things mean um, as we go throughout our class today. Well, uh, you know, I want to start with this question um, of how, how should we remember the French Revolution? Uh, and as we ask ourselves this question, I, I provided three different uh, quotations for us to, to, to think about. And I think, I think in some ways you'll be able to see how, how these quotations relate to uh, the, uh, the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears, how um, we have sort of three different um, choices in terms of how perhaps we could remember it. Um, well, who would like to read this, this first quote from a poem, um, the, uh, the very famous The Prelude um, by William Wordsworth in 1850? I will. But t'was a Thank time you. when Europe was rejoiced, France standing on the top of golden hours, and human nature seeming born again. T'was in truth an hour of universal ferment. Mildest men were agitated in commotions, strife of passion and opinion filled the walls peaceful houses with unique sounds. The soil of common life was, at that time, too hot to tread upon. OK, thanks so much for that. Um, well, let's think about that quote as we look to the next one here, about how should we remember the French Revolution. Um, who would like to read this one? From Edmund Burke, um, the 9th of August, 1789. I will. Thanks so much. England gazing with astonishment at a French struggle for liberty and not knowing whether to blame or to applaud. The thing indeed, though I thought I saw something like it in progress for several years, has still something in it paradoxical and mysterious. The spirit it is impossible not to admire, but the old Parisian ferocity has broken out in a shocking manner. Okay. So now we have two under our belt, and let's go to the third one here. Um, and let's see, Brad, would you read this one for us? Yeah, yeah, let, one second here. I apologize. Okay. okay. All right, here we go. The French had shown themselves ablest architects of ruin that had hitherto existed in the world. In that very short space of time, they had completely pulled down to the ground their monarchy, their church, their nobility, their law, their revenue, their army, their navy, their commerce, their arts, and their manufacturers. There was a danger of an imitation of the excesses of an irrational, unprincipled, pros proscribing, confiscating, plundering, ferocious, bloody, and tyrannical democracy. In religion, in religion the danger of their, of their example is no longer from intolerance, but from atheism, a foul, un unnatural vice, foe to all the dignity and consolation of mankind, which seems in France, which seems in France for a long time to have been embodied into a faction accredited and almost avowed. Emmert Burke. 
Thanks so much. So, Thank and you. keep in mind, this this is Burke, just one year later from from the uh, the last one. Actually, not even a year. Uh, and so, just to review, we have the first one by Wordsworth, which is positive. The second one by Burke, which is sort of somewhere in between. He's not sure what to think of it. Uh, and then the third one, which is very negative. And so, then let's relate this. Um, from your reading about some of the causes of the French Revolution, uh, do you predict that you will judge the French Revolution to be good, bad, or somewhere in between? And please explain your answer, and I'd love to hear from everybody. Uh, and if you can, please try to relate what your prediction is to one, two, or three, those quotes that we read. Um, well, I think it was bad because, like it said in the third quote, um, they, uh, the, all their stuff kind of got destroyed, their navy, their army, their economy, all kind of went downhill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that, Walter. Who would like to go next? Um, I probably would have picked somewhere in the middle with just what we've read so far, just because, for example, some of the readings today, I got kind of the idea that they were just trying to equal out all the estates rather than kind of throw out the other two and just have it be the people. So just, I, I, I don't think I would have been sure at this point if I didn't know the future. I probably mm -hmm. would have been somewhere in the middle. Yeah, thanks for that, Christina. Are you wanting us to pretend like we don't know the, the end? Um, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that would be good. Um, either that or just based on what you've read. Um, and the causes you've learned about so far, and then these quotes, where would you be at this point in the revolution? Um, of course, we know that there are many stages to it, but we haven't studied those in depth yet. So let's sort of maybe put those on hold for a moment and just think about what we know. If, if you had been uh, Edmund Burke, for example, living uh, at the time of the revolution. Well, the only, the only quote you gave us that, quote you did, that had something good to say about it was Elizabeth, right, which was written far after? That's right, mm-hmm. And then Burke, Burke act, actually lived through it, but he was in England, is that right? Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I, if I hadn't known the end from the beginning, I, I, I hope I would have been smart enough to, to, to have looked back through 4,000 years of human history and, say, and know that revolutions almost always end up, you, always, you almost always end up with something at least as bad or worse than what you started with, and, mm -hmm. and that and that it was really risky, and that you would need God on your side. And so having, I suppose I would have lived through the French Enlightenment, I would be really, really nervous about that. Mm -hmm. Great. Wonderful answer. Who, who is next? I second what <laughs> Wendy just said. I think that people who live under oppression have a tendency to want to get rid of that oppression, obviously. Mm -hmm. But there's a right way to go about it and a, is it is it just freedom from op all oppression all anything that's shackling us or is it do we want to be free so that we can do god's will mm -hmm. and i think that there's a stark difference in just wanting to get rid of the power structure just because it's it's a big power structure rather than getting rid of something because you feel empowered by your creator Mm -hmm. that that is the right course to pursue. Yeah, great, great point there. Um, and then, let's see, Brad, are you the, are you the last one? Uh, Brad, Brad, would you like to answer this one? Okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll move on then for now. Um, you might come back later. Let's see. Okay, well, of course, um, you know, uh, your answers are, are wonderful. And, you know, I just, one of the things that I, I think is um, important is to remember that, you know, these people didn't know the end from the beginning either. And also, I do want to say, um, too, um, to be fair to Wordsworth, that uh, his prelude, this, this long poem um, written in blank verse, 
Uh, it was a look back through his life, sort of an autobiography of sorts in poetic form. Um, and he was writing this about what people felt at the beginning of the French Revolution. He himself, by the end of the revolution, thought it was a terrible thing, um, gone wrong, you know, good intentions gone, gone incredibly wrong. Uh, and so I just wanted to be fair to him. But I also wanted to use that quote because that was the feeling of so many people at the start. Oh, this could be great, you know, liberty. But then we see where things go when passions are not bridled. Um, and as, as part of that, we just see that there are so many different ways to look at the revolution, in part because there were so many different products of the revolution. And so just to say the French Revolution is a little bit of a misnomer, even though, of course, you'll hear it again and again and again, just because there were so many different governments created through revolution after revolution after revolution as France just kept turning around and around and around and around and around until literally it made itself sick. Uh, if, if you can imagine that that image, um, because the word revolution literally means a turning around, and they just turned around again and again. Uh, we can see these monarchies before 1789, 89 to 92, 1815 to 30, 30 to 48, republics 92 to 1804, and then 1848 to 52, empires 04 to 15, 52 to 70. We have revolutions or coup d'etat in 89, 92, 94, 99, 1830, 1848, 1851, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so keep in mind, this is uh, um, definitely the type of, 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 of study where uh, you really have to try to figure out where you are in the process of things um, to try to make any sense of it, because it changes so much, almost as the wind blows. Um, and so if, if, we, if we look at this then, and we ask ourselves, just from the reading you've done, um, you know, what caused the French Revolution, or the start of these revolutions? Um, what answers can you reason from your reading? Uh, and hint, certainly, there were political, cultural, social, religious, and economic causes. So anything's pretty much fair game. I'd say just as a general answer, um, frustration, probably in all of those categories you just mentioned. Um, just from the reading today, just to say the third estate is everything, and yet they have no political influence. That that reflects a lot of frustration of people that just felt oppressed, just like Wendy was saying earlier about just that feeling of wanting to just kind of break out from that. Um, I, just, I just see a lot of frustration probably economically, politically, socially. Yeah, great. Thanks for that answer. What else do we think? Well, I would well, say I, like a representation. Have... Sorry, Wendy. No, I, I didn't hear you. What'd you say? I would say lack of representation. Mm hmm Yeah, lack of representation, definitely. And we'll, we'll talk a lot about this. We talk about the, the three different estates um, and uh, representation. Uh, keep in mind, we're also talking about, uh, about wanting representation in an absolute monarchy, which is sort of a very interesting, um, an interesting situation. And we'll have to talk about uh, where that representation even comes from, um, because uh, it would only happen at certain times. Um, in, uh, in French history under an absolute monarchy. And was there a shortage of bread, food, some kind of famine or something going on? Yeah, there was. There, there were many, many social reasons. Now, of course, um, you know, some people would have you believe that that was everything, um, but um, it wasn't everything, but it was certainly something. And so, yes, there, were, there, there was famine, bad harvest, um, Price of bread going through the roof, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, lump that together with, uh, as we'll as we'll see, um, um, a a population of people who were just stuck in a very bad place and couldn't really get out um, because of the political systems that were in place. Uh, and so, yeah, that was a huge cause. Thanks for pointing that out, Wendy. I I wonder, have you ever heard um, theories about um, about the the shortage of food being being somewhat oh what's the word planned so that there that there were that there were some people believe that there were forces that um, were trying to instigate this. Yeah, you know there there are definitely people who um, who have talked about how these these forces uh, or that 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 some of this was perhaps planned um, definitely exaggerated. Uh, and certainly, I mean, if you look at France during the 1700s, there were times um, where harvests um, were bad. There were times where um, life was tough for, for peasants, for the middle class, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but um, revolutionary ferment uh, ended up agitating the people so much um, that many people really did become demagogues. 
um, and used the power of the press to prey upon the fears of those who were uneducated uh, and in a bad place. Um, and so because of that, um, we have um, the common that we have the masses feeling that you know the price of bread um, is an indication of this extreme extreme oppression um, when in perhaps it could have just been a lot of things coming together at once um, and like I said before certainly um, there were other bad harvests other you know difficult economic times um, but because of where life had been going, if you think about the Enlightenment, if you think about throwing off the shackles of tradition, this you know ancien regime, you know the ancient order of things, the old way, you think about you know absolute monarchy, feudalism, um, a state church, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, that through the Enlightenment, this French Enlightenment, um, with people like Montesquieu and Rousseau, who we've read, you know, trying to figure out a way to undo what they saw as sort of the superstitions of the past and to come into a new age based on reason, that with this in mind, the time was ripe um, for a blooming of propaganda that certainly influenced um, the common person to believe that what was going on was um, perhaps more serious than it was, even though there certainly were some um, tough times um, that did happen. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, I, ferment is a good word. I, I mean, it's just history shows that there's always people who are power hungry and, and, mm -hmm. and are evil and, and are willing to take advantage of situations to promote mm -hmm. what their agenda. Yeah, definitely. Thanks so much for, for pointing that out, Wendy. And, and was that Lori who uh, were, you were saying something? Yeah. Hi. Um, I also wanted to bring up one point, and this may have been discussed. I missed the last couple of classes. Oh, so, okay. Sure. Um, if it was brought up, I apologize. Um, I was reading some history last year about the French Revolution and reading that the Huguenots were pushed out of the country mm -hmm. uh, several decades before the French Revolution. and have you talked about that at all? Uh, no, we, have, we haven't talked about that. that. That's a little earlier than, than when we've started in terms of the causes of the French Revolution, but go ahead if, okay. you, if you'd like to. Well, and I don't, I don't necessarily think that was a cause of the revolution, but I do think it's interesting that as the government pushed out those salt-of-the-earth Protestants, those people who were just simply trying to live their religion, um, such as the Protestants in England and Germany, and you know, it was a very big Protestant movement earlier that century mm -hmm, and I just mm -hmm. find I found it interesting that that the French Revolution occurred and they had just they had just pushed out all of these these uh, Protestants and yeah. so it was unfortunate because that's that's a, a good section of your population that is God fearing and you know simple good religious people mm -hmm, that they mm -hmm. that they now didn't have among them yeah. So it kind of, yeah. I think it kind of had to, led to more of the atheistic movement in the French Revolution because they didn't have those solid Protestant people there to kind of help. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I, I appreciate you pointing that out. You know, it really is telling if you look at the character of the French Revolution and you, and you look at the, um, the relativistic, the atheistic, the sort of anti-established uh, religionistic nature um, that it would assume um, in uh, during especially during the first republic the reign of the terror uh, you know it's very interesting to say that that character you know you could say has roots in um, the booting out of these French Huguenots uh, and so thanks so much for pointing that out um, and that'll that'll certainly be a, a useful bit of information to remember as we continue talking about uh, the character of this revolution versus others thanks a lot for that comment um, well, well, let, let's look at some of these causes. And one, once again, oh, hello. You know, this is Brad. You know, I'm, I'm having some uh, some technical problems with my phone. It, it keeps breaking oh. in now. But I did want to get a uh, a comment in. You asked, you know, you asked me what what were the causes of the French re 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 Revolution, and I think the last comment really nailed it. And and it was the I mean, what was there, or what were the difference between the Americans and the and the uh, French? And it was the morality of the people. It was it was the bit. I mean, just what that uh, our, our last comment, uh, or that, that last uh, gal made a comment. Mm -hmm. The difference was there were, there was a totally different morality base in France than there was in 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 um, uh, America, and the things that they fought for were different. 
mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in France. They wanted to put down, um, they wanted, they wanted, they had a, the, as much of their things were unjust and immoral. And, and, um, and that's, and that, I mean, they, they wanted to kill off, I mean, and, I mean, they, they had, they, they, their bag of uh, problems had been, had, were quite full, you know, and I'm sure they'd been fed up with a lot of things, but at the base of it, it was the morality of the people. Back to you. Yeah, thanks so much for that comment, Brad. I do, do appreciate it. Well, uh, if, we, if we look at some of these causes, you know, really, like I said, there's so many causes, um, you know, you can't just put your finger on any one thing, and, uh, and it's really just a complex uh, issue. But certainly, um, even though things had been bad before, they were bad during the time um, just preceding the French Revolution. So, you know, this came as a result of a long-term rise, just sort of a steady rise in grain prices, which, you know, was good for farmers, good for those, uh, you know, if you were a feudal lord, um, if you were, um, you know, uh, a merchant um, selling these goods, that could be good for you. But uh, for a society where so many um, of its members were peasants, meaning working on other people's land, um, didn't have their own land, you know, it was bad for the poor. Um, there was a huge population growth um, in France uh, during the 18th century, the 1700s, and so there's less land for self-sufficiency even among those who can own land. Also, with those people who are trying to work other people's land, there's less of that land to go around as well. So there's really a squeezing of population going on here, and so we have an increased number of peasants who are dependent on rural work, someone else's land, and as well as an increased number of landless urban workers. Um, these aren't peasants. These are people who tried to find, uh, you know, day jobs, digging ditches, etc. you know, in uh, the cities of France. We have lots of people unemployed, not enough jobs to go around in the country or the city. Um, wages, as well, failed to keep price, excuse me, pace with the price increases that were going on. And so we have this sort of growing desperation. Like I said, this wasn't the only time, but this was a characteristic of this time as well. Um, from the 1770s onward, um, and keep in mind too, after the 1770s, right, we have uh, you know Montesquieu writing in 1748, which is the spirit of the laws. We have Rousseau writing 1762. And now here we are in the 1770s. So those ideas have had plenty of time to germinate and spread um, and grow throughout the population. Um, and so the, especially we think of Rousseau's ideas about democracy um, and the equaling of the people, et cetera, et cetera, they went a long way when times were tough for the common man. And so things are increasingly bad. We have a recession. Uh, and peasants bore the brunt of that recession um, just because of the way the tax system was set up. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Um, but um, the noble and then bourgeois, and so bourgeois is just another fancy word coming from the French Revolution for middle class. The middle class landowners, uh, they uh, lowered wages for the peasants, and they increased their dues, these feudal dues. You know, if you work this land, well, you have to pay me this much. OK, you'll have to use my supplies. You have to pay me this much, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so they were really squeezed. And so statistically speaking, 80 to 90 percent of the peasants were below the subsistence level. And in the peasant class alone, four-fifths almost 80% of their income went to taxes of one sort or another, either feudal dues, charges, um, or government taxes. And that was the way that the tax system uh, was arranged to really squeeze the peasants and be light on the top classes, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail in a second. Um, 1775, there's what was called the Flower War, which was this riot over grain shortages. Um, there had been riots before. So this isn't necessarily uncommon. This wasn't the first or certainly the last. Um, but it was one that happened that just sort of was another straw on this, you know, mounting pile on the camel's back. Um, the cattle plague uh, diminished the beef supply. Uh, France's industry, because if we think about it, uh, the Industrial Revolution began in the mid-1700s in England, and then it would start to filter down. Uh, and so industry in its very early stages was faltering in France. Um, as a result of all these things, we have these secondary um, causes, which, which are just sort of um, very symptomatic of a society in, the, in this way. Um, Brad goes back to Brad's comment about morality. We have petty crime increasing, and also child abandonment increased very sharply, uh, which is you know incredibly sad. Really, we just have a society in shambles uh, in many ways. If we look about at this in terms of the social and political problems, um, it's important to know that uh, at the time of the French Revolution, there were about 28 million people in France. Um, and they were divided into three classes. 
at least the French divided themselves into three classes, called the states. Uh, there was the first, the second, and the third. Um, the first state was the Roman Catholic Church clergy, uh, and so um, by this time, um, other minority religious groups were certainly persecuted, um, going back to um, Lori's comment. Um, and so the clergy, which 130,000 in all, um, they controlled through, through church-owned lands, um, 10 to 15 percent of French land. Um, but um, they were exempt from nearly all taxes. Um, the second estate, this was the estate of hereditary nobility. This was the estate that Montesquieu felt very strongly about. He thought they were incredibly important. Uh, this was, would be the estate that Rousseau um, didn't uh, think was important. Um, he would focus on the third estate in terms of um, what he thought was the virtue of the people. Um, but there were 300,000 of these nobles. Um, and they controlled about 30%, or a little over 30% of the land. Uh, and they paid relatively low taxes. In fact, um, the French um, system was set up so that these first two classes wouldn't be taxed for revenue. Uh, they would be taxed in other little matters, almost if we think about the distinctions between the external and the internal taxes uh, of the American Revolution. The third estate, that was everybody else. Think of it, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, you know, everybody from the merchant to the beggar. Um, so 27 plus million people, because if you look at the first two estates, uh, 430,000 people um, out of 28 million. So you have 27 plus million people. Now they held about 55% of the land, um, which of course um, is disproportionate to their numbers, clearly. Um, but it's important to note that if you look at France, uh, the, the population of France at the time of the revolution, 22 million of them were peasants, people working on other people's land, 80% um, of the total population. Um, and they held a severely disproportionate amount due to feudalism, okay, where we have a king, and he can't administer his land, he gives it to lords, lords gives it to others beneath them, and then they sort of rent out the work on the lands um, to these people who don't have anywhere else to go. Um, and so they were paying four-fifths of their income in taxes. Uh, and the third estate was the estate from which the French government tried to get revenue, and so they were heavily taxed in general. Now, the interesting thing, going back to representation, because I'm not sure if any of you asked yourself this question, but um, when Heidi said representation, she was completely right. But she was talking about representation in an absolute monarchy. And so you might ask yourself, well, wait, when do they even have the opportunity to be represented? Um, and so that's where we have uh, what's known as an estates general, uh, which is a time when the king could convene these three estates to vote on reforms. It was his opportunity to consult the people if he wanted to do so. Um, the tradition was that each estate would get only one vote. And so this is what Heidi is talking about in terms of representation. And so this means that the first two estates, 430,000 people, could outvote the third estate, 27 plus million people, every time if the first two estates voted together, because they had a 1-1-1 one, one, one split of votes because it was based on order rather than population, which is one of the things that Abi Saye will talk about in his What is the Third Estate. OK, um, getting to what Wendy talked about, because you, you've all been hitting all these little nails on the head um, here. There, there were terrible harvests in 1787 and 88 uh, that sent the bread prices sky high. Um, it is interesting to note um, that uh, whether it was through somebody um, skewing the data to make things look worse than they were, or whether it simply was a true fact, uh, the price of the standard loaf of bread, which was the stable for most French families, and then 50% of a peasant's diet, it did reach its highest point uh, of the entire 18th century um, in the middle of July 1789, which was the time when, and this is where going to Wendy's comment, you know, was there a conspiracy? Um, perhaps you know, it is hard to definitively um, you know, point to, to yes or no. Um, but, you know, this was when the Bastille, July 14, 1789, which was this harsh symbol of royal power, this was when it was stormed by an angry Parisian mob. Uh, and so, coincidence, uh, that's, you know, for history to judge. I'd love to see the, the footage someday when I pass through the veil. Um, well, also, along with all of these other causes, there was a crisis in the French government. Um, think of it, the Seven Years' War, or the French and Indian War, had been terribly expensive. Um, they, France had the largest army in, in Europe. It needed to be um, re-outfitted. Um, they decided to build up a navy because one of the reasons why um, Britain had beaten them in the past was because of its big navy, so they tried to match it. Um, this also helped building up the navy, helped the Americans win the War of Independence. Um, and so these two wars combined, um, Seven Years' War, uh, or the French and Indian War, um, plus the American Revolution led to borrowing and debt, and over half of the country's tax income went just to pay national debt 
by the 1780s. So we have lots of mismanagement going on. Um, there's a credit problem, um, as is always the case when government is in shambles in this way. Um, you have the Minister of Finance, Necker, uh, who had, didn't raise taxes, even though he financed the uh, aid um, of the French to the Americans during the American Revolution. It brought them to the brink of bankruptcy, and then he left office. Uh, and Cologne, the new minister, uh, tried to introduce a new land tax bill, but the peasants were already taxed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so there is this public opinion that really goes to what a couple of you have talked about um, that is so much against this perceived corruption of the monarchy um, and the nobility. Uh, and there are huge protests, protests, lots and lots of propaganda. Propaganda about the king, about his private life, uh, propaganda about the ministry and, and their raising of taxes, and um, propaganda about the price of bread and why it's going so high, etc., 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 to try to get the people, which had been prepared by the Enlightenment philosophies, um, to be riled up to an extent um, that it hadn't seen before. And so they're blaming um, all these difficulties um, on, on the royalty, uh, court extravagance, and then, of course, the taxation. And so it's interesting if you, if you look at the documents, the public opinion was very skillfully um, against, uh, and it demonized the monarchy and its supporters, and it pushed for change. OK, well, finally, take a big deep breath. <laughs> lots and lots of different causes. We do have some change. And this is, this is where, now, with all of this context, I hope that your reading makes a little bit more sense, um, which, is, which is what I'm trying to do here for you today. Um, with this extensive look at the coming of the revolution. In 1788, Louis XVI, who was the king of France, one of the Bourbon kings, he finally accepts that there's no way out of the crisis, and so he decides to consult the nation. And so he convenes the Estates General. The last time it had been convened was 1614. So that was the last time the people had an opportunity at representation. Um, and so it's convened, um, and it's once again a king called temporary national legislature. Um, and then the members get together to meet locally to discuss grievances. Uh, you, have, you read one of the book of grievances that they put together to state their case uh, and also to elect representatives. Um, and the estates general, the official one, was to meet at Versailles, which was uh, the seat of power for the French royal government. Um, well, once this estates general does come together, the third estate by this time has been riled up so much uh, by everything going on, including the propaganda, um, that it refuses to conduct business until voting is done by population, with all three estates sitting together in a single body. Uh, so that way, of course, 27 plus million could outvote the 430,000 rather than the other way around, um, rather than by doing it uh, through the estate method, which was the traditional way of doing it. So there's the six-week six week stalemate. And then finally, the third estate just declares itself a national assembly and then calls for a constitutional monarchy. And we'll see what happens with that um, as, as we go on in the course. OK. And so you know, it's interesting here, because if you look at the third estate, it felt that it spoke for the true nation. Um, and it criticized this ancien regime, the ancient French order of the feudal system, absolute monarchy, four state church, and limited individual rights. Um, at this time, you have even more propagandistic pamphlets and newspapers, which grease the wheel of revolution. Um, we have a process of election. Uh, which led to the creation of these books of grievances, which you read against the current government. And so basically through all of this, the poorer classes are feeling empowered by this propaganda and by the situation um, of life, and they're trying to seize, seize the day. Um, OK, so let's get to the reasoning then. Um, now that you have more information, I'm very curious. Um, what do you think? Were the causes of the French Revolution good? bad, or somewhere in between. And I'd love to hear every person give an accounting for whatever you think. Are, do you mean that they were good or bad or somewhere in between causes for the French Revolution? Mm -hmm. Well, once again, I'm probably going to be somewhere in between just because Obvi there, there seems to be a need for change at this point, not knowing the future. Um, a lot of things are unfair politically. There are a lot of economic problems. Um, there's a representation issue. I definitely think that um, there were a lot of good reasons for change. Now, for the French Revolution itself and everything that went along to it, that's, you know, that would put me more on, no, that, that was a bad way to go about it. But um, I definitely think that with everything we know right now, there was a need for some sort of change. And so you know, you can see where I'm kind of in the middle. 
Yeah, thanks so much for that. And I appreciate you taking the courage to, to go first and have your opinion out there. Who would like to go next? I agree. It sounds like there was need for change. And I certainly don't think I am any expert on the causes of the French Revolution. But it, it looks like there was need for change. There was need for something to happen. But did they, did they go about it the right way? Well, <laughs> it doesn't seem like they did necessarily. But, but uh, who am I to say? It, it sounded like there was need for change, but I can't say that it was good. So I'm mm -hmm. somewhere in between, too. Yeah, thanks so much for that. Let's see, are you, are you waiting for somebody to comment? I, I, I am. I, I'd love to hear from each of you if, if you feel comfortable. You know what? Uh, I'm just going to take a, a little bit different. It, when, I, when I'm reading this and listening to this, it sounds so familiar to what is being uh, written on our own headlines. You know, um, that's, 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 the, that's the thing that kind of has, has gripped my mind as we've been discussing this. Mm -hmm. So back to you. Oh, thanks, Brad. Thanks for that. That that actually is a good point because it's that was kind of Barack Obama's thing is it's time for change. Mm -hmm. But um, the the question is what kind of change? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because mm -hmm. kind of like with the French Revolution, you went from a change you went for a change that was devastating. Mm -hmm. And so now yeah, you definitely just, had change. But <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So definitely. Thanks for that. I'm going to have to stick with my earlier answer that it, that it was bad. I've been really taken with this quote you gave us from Dallin Oaks mm -hmm. from 1976 when he said that um, even an impressive government that limits freedom is preferable to a state of lawlessness and anarchy in which the only ruling principle is force mm -hmm. and every individual citizen has a thousand oppressors. Lincoln was espousing this when he said there is no grievance that is a fit object of redress by mob law. Mm -hmm. and. So I'm going to have to say this is one of those situations where that, that advice applies. I, don't, I, I have a really bad taste in my mouth from some little revolutions I've tried to create in the Salt Lake, in Salt Lake County. And um, so I, you know, I, just, I just see it, it as being really risky unless you're absolutely 100% certain that God's on your side and mm -hmm. that you, you know, you, you, you're certain you're doing the right thing and that the people that you're working with have pure hearts. Right, right. And so if you're doing it without God, watch out. Right? <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Um, is there anybody else who'd like to comment? And of course, I would never force you to comment, but I, I would invite all of you to. Well, I was just going to say that I think that their cause was just. And mm -hmm. it's hard to say if they would have just sat back, if things would have really changed. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know what I would have done in that situation. I mean, I really appreciate the comment you know, the quote that Wendy read. And I think trying to do it within the confines of the law is always the wisest. Mm -hmm. But you have to ask yourself the question, at what point when you are not being heard, do you uh, revolt? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. Well, um, but I don't if there's anybody else. chopping off heads. So that's going a little too far. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you for that. Um, well, well, you know, it, the, you know, the interesting question is, how far is it? You know, where is the mark where uh, dialogue is used, and where is the mark when they pick up their pistol? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you look at the country. Are, are, are you are United States of America right now? Um, if you look at the tea parties that were held all summer long, I mean, there's a vast there's a, there's a vast movement in this country that is very concerned about what's being proposed by the government mm -hmm. and there's a, a good factor of the government that doesn't seem to be listening. At least these are, they're, they're reportedly not listening. Mm -hmm. And so what news channel you watch. Right. Oh, yeah. And so, I mean, how close, how close is the United States of America in the year 2009, and you know, here we are in December, to a similar crossroads that, that, the, French were, that the French were, you know, faced with? Back to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, great comment, Brad. Uh, thanks for that. 
Well, let's just sort of relate this because you know I think it is interesting as as I as I, I have listened to all of you. You know, it's interesting. Um, and how how would you relate what you've said to to this quote here? Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I think that goes right along with what I was saying. You really you really have to know that your cause is just, that God is on your side, and that all the people you're working with have pure motives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Well, an another scripture then. Um, right. Wherefore, men are free according to the flesh, and all things are given them which are expedient unto man, and they are free to choose liberty and eternal life to the great mediator of all men, or to choose captivity and death, according to the captivity and power of the devil. For he seeketh that all men might be miserable like unto himself. Second Nephi 2.27. Any insights on this one, or more of the same? Well, something that just struck me as you were reading that is, I'm really grateful we don't have to be like the peasants in the French Revolution trying to find a way to break out of oppression. If we were trying to go about it ourselves to break out of um, our our uh, plight here on earth where we're making all sorts of mistakes and we're going to die, we would never make it. It would be chaos trying to find a way to, to have eternal life. And so just it just kind of strikes me that I'm grateful that when it comes to our eternal salvation that there is a way to choose liberty and it's not a way that um, would make us go overboard. It, we just need to follow Jesus Christ, as you circled here, the great mediator, in order to, to attain li liberty. So we yeah. have guidance. Yeah, thanks so much for that. You know, and, and I, too, am just so grateful um, for Jesus Christ, um, who is uh, the bringer of true liberty. Um, and uh, I'm grateful that, that I can follow him. Um, well, can I make a comment, Mr. Gentile? And that is, please, uh, please you'd do. like to call Nick or Nicholas? Or? Oh, well, Mr. Gentile well, is probably best in the classroom setting. Okay, Mr. Gentile, uh, um, here, the fact that you brought in that scripture from, from 2 Nephi mm -hmm. um, it, uh, just shows that, there, that, that you're basically you're relying on, re, on a revealed uh, principle from heaven. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you, go, you, know, when you look at, the, uh, when you look at the, the, you know, those eight words in the Declaration of Independence, the laws of nature and of nature is God, that was that was the very thing that that uh, that um, you know that was the standard by which we 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 promoted this revolution. And today, when when, when you when, when you're when you're a legislature or you're 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 a government of a people, and you're not using that uh, those revealed laws, mm -hmm. then what are you using? Mm -hmm. And then it becomes just a battle of who's got the biggest uh, biggest. Um, that that really, I mean, it, it, I think so. So often, you know, we uh, uh, we as LDS folks um, don't really r r understand how valuable that little backbone is. Back, I mean, you just revealed the backbone of the body. And when you're when when you're growing up here, I'm in Sonoma County. Uh, I, I worked the Prop Eight. Uh, I, I worked with Prop Eight, and I remember going to one of the kids that I that I. Um, I coached in football or basketball, and he was like a 14, 15 year old kid. And his dad answered the phone or answered the door, mm -hmm. and I asked him about where he was. You know, I was I asked him about where, he, which way he was voting. and He was voting against the, mm -hmm. the you know, the Prop 8. And I walked away thinking, "Wow, I, you know, I wouldn't have never thought that that that, that standard wasn't being held up in that home." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what? So where is he getting his? What what standard is he? is he using? And so, right. back to you. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, let's see. Mr. Gentile? Yes. I have one quick comment I just wanted to make. Oh, yeah, um, please, please I, do. We are so blessed to have the Book of Mormon because it gives us so many examples of how the Lord works with people. Mm -hmm. And the thing that comes to my mind is, is the story of Alma and his people that were in bondage. And the Lord caused that the Lamanites would go to sleep, and that they would be able to escape. And I think that that is, it's a really important story because um, I think that, that, that we need to remember that in our political lives. Mm -hmm. I don't think the Lord expects us to go out and just revolt 
when there mm -hmm. are injustices wrought upon people and upon ourselves. I think that many times he, he's just asking us to turn to him and he will actually help us out of the situation we're in. And with the United States of America, with the Revolutionary War, the, 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 um, the United States did not necessarily start it. When, when that first um, gun went off at Lexington, it was, of course, they don't know who fired first, but it was more of a don't, fi don't fire unless fired upon. The whole mm -hmm. Revolutionary War was a defensive measure because England wanted to come in and take our ammunition. They wanted to take the only way we had to defend ourselves. And that's where we said, okay, you're not going to do, that's a line you're not going to cross. You're not going to take our weapons. But they did, they tried to do it anyway. So I just feel like with the, with the revolt, it's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. History has shown us that revolting is very dangerous in the anarchy that follows. But if we trust the Lord, you know, who knows what he has planned. Right, right. Yeah, thanks so much for that. And I, I just appreciate the great discussion that we've, we've had this far today. So thanks, everybody. Um, well, you know, I, I also, we can perhaps just think about this one um, as well. You know, I've always loved this quote by President Benson. Um, you know, he talked about how the war that began in heaven over um, the issue of agency, over this issue, is not yet over. The conflict continues on the battlefield of mortality, and one of Lucifer's primary strategies has been to restrict our agency through the power of earthly governments. Um, and so another thing to keep in mind as we think about, about these people and, and, and their choices. Um, well, if we, if we look then briefly at, at Abi Saye, what is the third estate? Um, what does he mean by those three questions and answers at the beginning of his essay? I almost felt like I was reading a modern author. He seems to, and I don't know if that's the way the, the, the third estate spoke, but he's definitely speaking to his audience, I think. It's really mm -hmm. simple, you know, the everything, nothing, something. It's, mm -hmm. it's just, I think it was, for his audience, it was brilliant. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. That's a great, great insight. Um, you know, and I, I think it is so interesting, you know, what is the third estate? Everything. What has it been hitherto in politics? Nothing. What does it ask to become something? And of course, you know, um, there's just such, such a, a universal appeal in wanting to become something. And well, how, how would anyone tell you that you couldn't become something, you know? And so it is just this pulling on the heartstrings. Um, excellent. You know, and if we look then, you know, so why, why were they unhappy? What, what, does, what does he say? Why was this, this third estate, 27 or so million people, why was it unhappy? Well, one reason is they were taxed to death. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. How would you like to earn $20 or $100 in a day and give 80% 80, 80 of it to the government? Right. And go home with your, and, and, eat, and, eat, and try to buy bread with in, in inflating prices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. While, while, the, while the nice carriage goes by and they're all, you know, pripped up and ready to go to the party. And they're and they're not paying any tax or anything, you know, blah blah blah. Yeah, excellent, right? And and you know, and he he says himself too, you know, um, the third estate is everything, but it is a hobbled and oppressed everything. <laughs> um, so thanks for for pointing that out. Um, let's see. Now it's interesting because as, as he talks about about what he wants, and we were to reason this, and you know, we're a little short on time, so we'll go a little bit quickly through this here. Um, but we've certainly been been discussing things that are rich, and I'm grateful for it. Um, you know, what does he say that they want? To become something. Yeah, and, and, and what does that mean to him, to become something? He, he gives some things that are pretty general and others that are uh, very specific. Representative to what I was saying before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. to be represented. Yeah, and, and do, you have, do you have a quote from that at the end for us, Heidi? Hmm, well, let's see. The people wishes to be something, but in truth, a very modest something. They want to have real representatives in the Estates General, that is to say, deputies chosen from among their own ranks, who will be adept at, in, at interpreting their wishes and defending their interests. Mm -hmm. Is that a yeah. good quote? I don't know. That's just what I had marked. So. Yeah, no, that, that, that's, a, that's a great quote that gives the foundation, because you know, he goes on to talk about how, you know, what good would it do the people to take part in the Estates General if interests contrary to their own predominate? Right, and that, that's um, going back to that two to one where they can be outvoted. So 
the very, very end, after ta saying exactly what Heidi uh, quoted so well, um, he says at the very end, therefore, right, the third estate demands that votes be counted by head and not by order. Uh, so um, Can I he ask wants a the question. Sure, please. Were people, if they, they hadn't convened this estate, this general, whatever you call it, for 1614, were, was the average person even aware that they only had one vote against the other two estates? Uh, well, <laughs> it depends on whether or not they were illiterate enough, but certainly by, by the time that things got bad enough, people were saying, hey, the king should call an estate general again. It's time, you know, things are bad enough. And then, of course, because they started realizing that the time was perhaps ripe for another estate general, then they were saying, well, wait a minute, but even if he calls one, we're not going to get uh, any change that will help us because we still can be outvoted two to one because they're voting by order or by estate. So they definitely didn't know about it. Does, it, does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So, of course, the count by head, you know, 27 plus million uh, and not by order where it could be two to one, that is certainly in their favor. Um, you know, and it's interesting because he also goes on and talks about how, um, you know, without, without these other two classes to boss them around, that they would be, as he talks about on page 22, um, everything but a free and flourishing everything. Um, and he talks about how nothing can function without the third estate. Everything would work infinitely better without the other estates. Uh, and so as we can see here, we have the people who they want change, but at the same time, they're really starting, um, as, as all of you have talked about, to get this notion of democracy that will become one that is, will be so hard for them to bridle that many of them will stop bridling it and will turn into this mobocracy uh, and this rule of, a, of particular will, as Rousseau would say, instead of the general will, which is really doing what's best for everybody. Um, well, just... Um, we're out of time, unfortunately, but if we look here, of course, there are lots of things. Uh, Book of Grievances talks about lots of the grievances that we already talked about today. Um, and let's see here. Basically, just to end, you know, I, I really appreciate uh, Lori um, and um, Heidi, Wendy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So many people have been mentioning, basically, without mentioning these scriptures. Um, and I just wanted to close by, by reading them. Doctrine and Covenants 101.76 uh, and then Doctrine and Covenants 134.11. Um, and again I say unto you, those who have been scattered by their enemies, it is my will that they should continue to importune for redress and redemption by the hands of those who are placed as rulers and are in authority over you. And then we believe that men should appeal to the civil law for redress of all wrongs and grievances where personal abuse is inflicted or the right of property or character is infringed, where such laws exist as will protect the same. But we believe that all men are justified in defending themselves, their friends and property, and the government from the unlawful assaults and encroachments of all persons in times of exigency, where immediate appeal cannot be made to the laws and relief afforded. Uh, and so, you know, thanks so much for, for your, your great uh, reasoning, which is, which is a prudent and a wise and a faithful uh, reasoning according to true principles. Um, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for the strength that we have here in this class that, you know, we're not... Um, you know, sort of just blown about by every wind of doctrine uh, or every notion of, of rights, um, uh, you know, or equality, et cetera, et cetera. But we realize that um, things do need to be done in wisdom and in order um, so that we don't run faster than we have strength, which I think in many cases we could certainly say about the French Revolution, they ran faster than they had strength because they didn't have the wisdom or the order that God would have sanctioned. Um, anyway, so thank you so much for everything. I look forward to uh, seeing you on Monday. Thank you, Mr. Gentile. Okay, take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.